Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us early. Just uh, going to be holding for another minute or so as people join us. Uh, thanks for logging on. Uh, we'll be starting soon. Thanks for joining us early. I think we're going to hold for just a few more seconds and then we're going to go ahead and kick this off. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the NAFA webinar, Creating Voice Within the Customer Journey. My name is Zach Hules, and I'm the Program Engagement Manager at NAFA. With me today is Martin Saavedra, Jr., but everyone calls him Jr. Uh, he is Executive Vice President of MLI Marketing Solutions in Tampa, and he has been in the data and marketing industry for over 25 years. In that time, he's worked with companies such as AIG, Sun America, Sun Life, Valak, and others. Uh, with the release of Silhouette, Junior and his team have been fixated on the customer journey experience and how to make sure advisors have a voice within the path to purchase. If you are not seen, then you can't be heard. So with today's webinar, we're hoping that we can take away key points that will make you seen and heard by today's clients. But it is now my pleasure to turn things over to our special guest today. Junior, how are you doing? And I uh, can't hear you there. You on mute there? I am doing fantastic. How are you today? Good stuff. Good. Awesome. Awesome. So um, thank you, everybody, for allowing me to uh, take the time with you, and I, I really do appreciate it. Um, you know, the path to purchase is something that I don't think has really been that explored, per se, within the financial services industry. I think the big banks and the big houses, they do it very well because they have the budgets, but the independent financial advisor, I think, is kind of struggling through some of that. So a couple of things that we wanted to unpack uh, during this time was, you know, again, how to have that voice within the customer path to purchase, how to be relevant within the path to purchase, um, and, and, and really to kind of showcase or also share some of the things that we've learned within um, other industries like the automotive industry that we talk about digital retailing, right? So today, we wanted to unpack that, explore that, give you a couple of tips and tricks and, and insight on how you as an independent advisor can really uh, get in front of the consumer and stay consistent with the consumer while they're on that path to purchase. So we think it's really important to recognize that we obviously live in a digital world, especially through the COVID epidemic. We've seen how digital has played a much larger role in touching and engaging the consumers. Right, so we need to know where the consumers uh, are and, and, and we need to make sure that we identify them, right, when they're in the path to purchase. And they need to know that we exist. They need to know that the advisors exist and the advisors are relevant. And that when they're ready, advisors will be there for them. You know, the financial consumer is, 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 is a very um, fickle consumer because Quite frankly, even though they need to do something, they typically don't do anything until life forces them into that wedge moment that forces them to make or take the action. Um, the other thing that we wanted to talk about was also, it's important, it's more than, than just having a website. I know every advisor has a website, but um, it's what are we doing with that content? What are we doing with that site? And then what are you doing to emphasize or to, to make sure that you get a conversion or a visit to that site? Okay, so today, advisors, they, you need to understand uh, terminology, terminology like repeat visit rate, right? 
who's in market, when are they in market, and then what is the repeat visit rate or the RVR of your customers or prospects today, right? So those are some of the things that we need to know and we need to make sure that we can unpack and see. Um, the other thing is if you don't know your site analytics and you're missing out on opportunities daily. So again, a lot of you have um, worked with an FMO or worked with an IMO or worked with a third party that has created a site but then you are invisible to actually the traffic and the analytics that are happening or engaging with your site, right? So what is your bounce out rate? If it's 50 above, if it's above 50%, then what are you doing to combat that? What are you doing to drive that down? Is your content up to date? Is your content from 2019 or is it from 2015 or is it from 2020? Some of those things, right? So when you can hone in on the simple things that you can do as an advisor, it makes a huge impact in being able to convert consumers that are uh, repeatedly visiting your site or, or have a repeat visit rate within, uh, within the market. So we want to get it down to really kind of like a, a simple science like Harley-Davidson does. Harley-Davidson knows that it's six to eight visits, showroom visits, before you purchase a Harley, before you convert as a customer. So as you continue to go into the showroom, they're nurturing their consumers along the path to purchase. Now, those six to eight showroom visits could take a year. They could take six months. It could take three months. But it doesn't matter because each journey is specific to that customer and to the, what that customer wants to get or that consumer wants to get accomplished as, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a visitor. So I want to be able to, we want to be able to hone in and get to the point where we're looking at metrics in this industry with that much clarity and with that, with that much emphasis. So one of the things that we did was we kind of um, mapped out what that customer journey might look like. And the fact of the matter is it can be a lot more detailed and a lot more robust than this, right? And as we were mapping this out, we really left off a ton of information and a ton of steps. And we kind of condensed it a little bit because quite frankly, this could have been the whole entire presentation. But if you look at like, you know, the imaginary consumer Joe, who's a graphic designer, he's 32 years old, and he has a child, has a second child in the way, makes about $150,000 in income producing assets. One of the things that we're looking at is what is the awareness or what is the stimulant that is creating Joe to become an in-market consumer, right? And then how is Joe or how is a consumer today going in and getting the information to start the process, to start the journey, to start considering what's going on. And if you look down the techniques that are down here, right, as Joe starts to engage or he starts to search, what's going to happen is he's going to get retargeted through banner ads and display ads and emails and direct mail and social. Now, the more that he fills out information within his path to purchase within the awareness column or does a lead form submission, the more information he's going to get. But the fact of the matter is most digital marketing today is really a pay to play. So you gotta be smart on how you, you position your marketing and how you get Joe and his attention, right? So you need to make sure that Joe is with, within that first 30 day segment that you have an awareness about Joe and that you can uh, get Joe to continue to consume your content and engage your content. Now, as you further out and further step out in your marketing, a lot of that's gonna be uh, relevant within your landing pages and with the direct mail and the navigational leaks and content that you're sending to Joe while he's at day 90 to 120. Because the path to purchase for a financial consumer is not a, a zero to 30 timeline, right? Even if it's 365 days, it's not a consecutive timeline that we're focused on. Because as most consumers know, you're in market today, you take a break, you're out of market, you come back into market sometime later, then you add in, you know, the, the times that you actually were in market as a consumer. So it's not a horizontal timeline that we're focused on. But as you step out your marketing practices, one of the things that you, you, you can do is that you can then, you know, look at how you're integrating your white papers, your landing pages, your podcast, all to a marketing engagement that allows the consumer to touch all of it at one time, right? 
don't be afraid to put what is on your website in front of the consumer where it's quick and easy accessible information to get all these details right and then when you do that now you're actually creating the lead engagement you're creating a follow-up engagement with each and every consumer that is in your in your nest if you would and so that you can nurture them down the decision tree to where you're you're inviting them to the webinar in office webinar hosting a webinar um, and, and getting them to actually book that meeting with you that eventually turns them into not only a client, but an advocate, right, where they're now referring their friends and families and so on. So we wanted to mind map that out for you, and we wanted to showcase for you how that, that, that movement within the customer journey, it is not a, a zero to 30. It's not a marketed, thus I must have leads today. And most marketing won't be like that for you. Um, so it's, it's not that one, you know, that silver bullet or that adrenaline shot that's going to get you what you want. What we want to be able to do is make sure that you have a process, you have an understanding of where consumers are at, and then how consumers engage um, within that path to process, within that path to purchase, and then how at certain moments when your firm or the advisor doesn't follow up or any firm doesn't follow up, how at certain moments it will teeter that consumer to go look somewhere else. It will give that consumer an opportunity to be somewhere else or to go engage with another advisor somewhere else. So when we, when we map, map this customer journey, I think it's, it's critical to note, you know, hey, you're probably looking at a cycle, a 365 day days in market cycle for some of these consumers, for some of the consumers that you're in, engaging with currently in your funnel. So it's, it's the little tips and tricks on how we can get them to convert sooner that allows them to obviously book an appointment sooner. So you want to identify consumers who are in market, right? You, you, you definitely want to be able to um, uh, identify consumers who are in market. And, and a lot of that is like, okay, well, how do we do that? Well, number one, I think that you, you don't look at income per se. Um, don't look at, at what, what your competitors are looking at. I think it's easy to, to purchase some of the data that you might be purchasing with an income producing standard or net worth standard, right? Because a lot of those consumers have been affected recently by what's going on the last couple of months. And a lot of them typically get affected throughout the year when the new year rolls around, when it becomes tax time, a lot of them are your clients, right? So if you do well at your own practice with a certain demographic or a certain set of clients, any of the new data that you go out and you, you gather should be a model of that existing client, right? So if you do well with high net worth investors and um, or high income producing assets, that's great. Um, go out and make sure you model your, your new data sets with those consumers that so you're attracting um, the same type of client and you're not having to redo your content. More importantly, you're not having to redo your messaging because if you alternate and you pivot to somebody who's, who's 45 years old, has two young kids, and you want to go after college planning, that's a completely different message and completely different ballgame. So make sure that you, whatever data sets you go after, you're, you're still modeling what's best for you and your practice, right? What's engaging with you and your practice at all times. Uh, yes, Robin, I, I, we're recording this for you, and, and you'll be able to uh, send this out uh, afterwards as well. So um, the other thing that we want to be able to do is look at um, nurturing. Okay, so again, a lot of advisors pay for leads. And they, you, you, they pay for leads, quite frankly, because they don't have a marketing process or a sales process built into their practice. One of the key components of marketing is to nurture. So, um, to make sure that, again, when consumers are in market, when consumers are engaged, when consumers are aligned with you, that you're nurturing them through relevant content. So a lot of you can get your content from FMOs, from, I, from your IMOs, from your broker dealers, or your wirehouses, or wherever. But the fact remains that just because you have this content, you need to make sure that it's, it's organized in a very clear and concise manner, not only at your site, but in all of your outbound communications. And I'm talking more than just a, a newsletter. I'm talking about making sure 
that you have a, a pivot link, if you would, a very direct link or an umbilical cord between your contact, between your content to your customer, and that you can identify who that consumer is, and it better be more than just, I saw that somebody read my email or I saw that I had a visitor. It needs to be a, a very direct link as to who the consumer is, and then what is the opportunity value of that consumer, so that when you develop this content strategy, you can then go on to the next funnel, which is a conversion funnel. And a conversion funnel allows you not to convert the consumer to a lead, but to convert an opportunity into an action, right? So that's why we want you to develop that content strategy to keep the consumer engaged. Again, I want to be clear that most marketing is not I marketed, i.e. the consumer should buy. You're marketing so that you can build a brand, and then you're marketing to ensure that that brand is very consistent and engaged with your consumers. And then your consumers will naturally convert based upon the content that you're sending back to them upon what it is they're looking for, right? So that's what this funnel is, is, is made to do. It's a consistent experience and onboarding process. And onboarding is not necessarily, we're gonna use that term as onboarding the client, but you're onboarding prospects into your, into your base camp of marketing data and then eventually nurturing that funnel into clients and client satisfaction and referrals and then repeat, right? The other thing that you should always do in, in pretty much any point in your marketing, because if you don't ask, the answer is no, is always ask for the appointment, right? Make it easy, especially today, for your consumers to do business with you and for your consumers to engage with you and your firm, whether it's a Zoom, a webinar, a one-on-one, -on -one, and guys, let's face it, also a FaceTime call. I probably had four or five FaceTime calls today. People are very, very used to it. So sometimes it doesn't need to be as complicated as a Zoom meeting. It could be like, hey, text, Zoom, or text, FaceTime call. Something very, very simple. So don't overly complicate it. Just make sure you have multiple avenues that a consumer can get in touch with you. And a consumer can get in touch not only with you, but your, your practice. So... All this sounds great, right? So I'm a small uh, advisor firm and I got one to two people. How do I do this? How do I, how do I actually do this, Junior? It sounds awesome what you're saying. It sounds expensive and awesome. Number one, it's not expensive. Here's a free tool. And a free tool is your Google Tag Manager, right? I would ask that you get familiar with your Google Tag Manager. And then I would also ask that you get familiar with, a, um, with Google Trends. And, and here's what I pulled in Google Trends for the last 90 days, right, for consumers that are looking at financial planning. Now, I have up here financial services, financial advisor, retirement planning, index universal life, and life insurance. These are very broad categories. And, and to tell you the truth, something like financial services, you're looking at banks and credit unions probably tied up into that search term as well. But financial advisor retirement planning, index universal life, and life insurance. And I want, to be able to, I want you to be able to use Google Trends because I would, I, in the previous slides, I was talking about content. So how should you know how to align your content with the right consumers? And quite frankly, most advisors, you really don't have a large digital budget to compete with a large firm, right? So before deploying a campaign, whether in Facebook or in Google, or at your site, make sure you know what consumers are searching for. The other thing I want you to do is I don't want you to sell a product. I don't want you to talk about how great annuities are. I don't want you to talk about index universal life. And I, I, I meet with a lot of advisors and they're like, hey, I'm looking for people that are looking for annuities. I'm looking for people that are looking for long-term care. I'm looking for people that are looking for index universal life. And the fact of the matter is, if you look here in the chart, you have life insurance, you have index universal life, but more importantly, you have retirement planning. Most people don't know what Index Universal Life is. They're not going to search and engage within that content pattern, right? So don't be product specific. Be very valued specific on how you can help consumers within uh, retirement planning, how your financial advisory services are better than the other person, how you have a tax planning uh, course that you want to invite them to and it has a life insurance component built into it. Whatever your, your, your value proposition is, that's what I want you to focus on. Because 
again, you could also take all of this, this data, right? And it's great that we have all this, and all this is free, again, and available by Google Trends. But the other thing that it's, it's, it's very focused on is most of the information that advisors are getting today is based upon a mother, is based upon a national reach, is based upon a national presence. And if you're in Little Rock, Arkansas, quite frankly, what do you care about what consumers are doing in the path to purchase in Sacramento, California? Those are two very distinct data sets. Now, most of the data that's gathered that's presented to advisors today are from very large firms that have a national presence and a very large national marketing department. And BI and data lakes and all these wonderful terminologies that, that, that everybody likes to kick around. AI, right? Everybody loves to use AI. Um, but quite frankly, it has nothing to do, again, with Phoenix, Arizona, with El Paso, Texas, with Tampa, Florida. It has nothing to do with it. So while you look at Google Trends, it allows you to really do, to hone in on your local level. I'm in Tampa, Florida, right? So I wanna look at the demographics within my, my area and how different they are versus the national trends, right? So even though um, I, I talked about long-term care, if I drill into certain counties, maybe long-term care is something that they are starting to look at, right? Maybe because a national firm went in there and pulled a big, big marketing campaign, and then you can piggyback off that marketing campaign because through Google Trends, you can easily see what people are searching for, what people are looking for, what are the topics that they're consuming, right? So your content engagement is now predicated upon behaviors, and it makes sure that you have the right content in front of the consumer while they're on that path to purchase. So again, Google Trends is a very free, it's, it's free, not very free, it's free, tool for you to use to enhance your practice and make sure the content on your site is aligned um, to those consumers that are actually engaged in searching. The other thing is now you have a way to streamline and align the content in your emails as well, right? So those are some of the key tricks or, or tips that we want to be able to present on how to make sure you have a, a, a very digestible and easy to use content strategy in front of these consumers. So most advisors, you're starting at a disadvantage. I'm going to be perfectly frank with you, right? So digital works best for the big budgets. And this tool that you're looking up here, it's a tool called Ghostry. And it's, it's, it's a cool tool because it allows us to see everything that's on a site as we engage in it. So take a huge firm like Raymond James, right? They have a massive marketing budget and massive marketing department and a massive everything. One of the other things that they have is a massive retargeting program. Now, within that retargeting program, you can see all of the, all of the items that they have that allow them to gather more data on a consumer, and it allows them to retarget all of these consumers. So as they go out and they retarget it, then you have to see somebody like Raymond James or Merrill Lynch or Edward Jones. And then now they're competing for all of those eyeballs and they're bidding all of this stuff up through the roof, right? So then it becomes, well, how do I, again, the independent financial advisor compete to be able to serve an ad or some sort of relevant engagement marketing to that consumer who's, who's actually looking um, and who's engaged within the path to purchase? How can I compete? And the fact of the matter is you can in very strategic manners based upon content and based upon the trends that you probably should look at every week um, from your site to uh, Google Trends um, and your Google Tag Manager so you can make sure that you're staying in steady alignment with all of these consumers. Because if you just go out and create a digital program or a digital marketing program, the fact of the matter is you're not going to be able to compete with the budgets that are out there today. What they spend in a day is what some of you have to spend in a year or a month. So we need to be careful with that, trying to go toe to toe. And a lot of companies present that they can do these types of strategies, but you, it's marketing and it's spend. And spend fuels the marketing. It's that simple, guys. So if you don't have a lot of fuel, then you gotta be smart with the marketing, okay? So 
Advisors need to know how to draw consumers, right, from their local areas. I want you to draw from your local areas, which is one of the reasons why I showed you um, Google Trends, one of the reasons why I want you to make sure that you become a, a good steward of your Google Tag Manager or your Google Analytics, and making sure that you have an idea or an awareness about what's going on with all of that day in and day out, or at least at a weekly basis. I always tell um, our automotive clients that, look, you can't drive, you know, you wouldn't be a captain of the sea and not have a nautical chart. You need these nautical charts to kind of tell you how you should pivot within your marketing. So again, Edward Jones, 28 tracking engagements. They're going to outspend you every second that, that they get. And the fact of the matter is you don't need to focus on anything that's larger than 25 miles of your, of your office. I know some of you, <coughs> excuse me, some of you are writing business across the country, especially now with, with the advent of Zoom and web meetings, you're going to be writing further away from your office. But the fact of the matter is I think most advisors are writing roughly 90% of their business 25 miles in. So your analytics, your, 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 your data shouldn't be north of that. It shouldn't be north of that range. You should stay within that range and that will give you enough of a radius to really do some good marketing, some good awareness about what's going on in your backyard. So then we're, 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 we have to look at conversion rates. Now, I, I pulled this from you, and it, this came from a, another service called uh, WordStream. And WordStream is pretty cool because it allows you to, to pivot quickly on, on certain keywords that are converting well. I would invite all of you to look at WordStream as a tool. It's not free but it is pretty cool in what it can do and it allows you to go a little bit further with your, with your Google Analytics and your Google Tag. But again, remember, marketing needs spend. Spend's the fuel for marketing. So if you don't have a big spend, then you gotta be strategic and tactical about how you're gonna do this. So when we talk about conversion, we, right, we're now we're, we're doing a good job of, of getting the right content to the right consumer and engaging those consumers. So what is the conversion that we should expect? Well, you've got to measure where your conversion is at today, and then you have to look at, okay, what's my benchmark? And in finance, again, this also includes, you know, banks and credit unions, so it's, it's, it's probably a little skewed. But I think you, you should rely on anywhere between a 2 to 4% conversion rate. Now, that's only if you have a, um, a lead form at your site. If any of your ancillary marketing or any of your ancillary email marketing and direct mail marketing, all of that should be included in your conversion rate. You should be modeling how, you know, what each silo of marketing is doing for you and your practice, and then what is the conversion rate that you are getting from each one. Um, so you need to look at making sure you have a benchmark conversion rate before um, you engage in this. So where are you at today? Draw the line in the sand and say, okay, this is the number I gotta be. This is strategically how I'm gonna go from A to Z, right? And then from there, that gives you a very good goal setting mindset within your marketing on how you can advance that. But you, I think anywhere should, from your site level conversions, you should be at roughly two to 4% to worst case scenario for, for everything that we're looking at. So create, um, you know, you have to have goals, and then that's what we were just talking about. Make sure you structure your campaigns to what your goals are. So if your goals are to accumulate more high net worth event, uh, 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 high consumers, that's great. But realize that a lot of advisors are also going after the same thing, and then you're also still combating the Goliaths, the, the Raymond James, the Edward Jones, and, and all the MetLife and all the others. So maybe think about how you're going to go after them differently. Structure your campaigns on what the consumers are actually looking for, and, and a good way to, to go after a high net worth individual really might be the tax and planning structure on how they can reduce their taxes for high net worth individuals. So first step is you gotta get traffic to your site, or you gotta make sure that the content at your site is is being shared with those consumers that are on that path to purchase. The other thing I want you to really do is I want you to take advantage of the Google Trends. It's there, it's free. Utilize it. You can really do some in-depth analysis of what's going on, and you can do some in-depth analysis of 
you know, how consumers are engaging with your, your site, but more importantly, how they're engaging with topics and search terminology today. Make sure that you're using and you do get familiar with Google Tag Manager. Each one of you have a uh, site. Each one of you have Google Tag Manager tied to your site as a function of having a site. So know your GTM analytics and use that as a roadmap to build effective campaigns. If we're going to start sending out the content, the content's going to come to the site. We nurture the consumer at the site level. They produce a lead or, and, and or set the appointment. That's what we're after. That's what we're looking for, and that's the goal that should be set for everything that we're looking at. So if we also map out what does that consumer journey look like today in a digital environment, in a digital environment, the standard digital consumer journey looks like a potential customer visits any site, they leave that site, and we all know this, we're all consumers, they shop competitors, and then uh, we're then serving display ads, the big guys are all serving display ads to you. But the fact of the matter is digital has a 0.07 to 1% chance of getting a click through, right? And then if you're using your Google Tag Manager correctly, when that consumer comes in, you're going to see where those conversions um, and, and who those consumers are based upon your email content, your Google Tag Manager, you're going to be able to see what they're doing and how frequent they're coming back in or that repeat visit rate. When you do that, um, you, if you don't do it right, then you're limited because you don't know who they are and you don't know what they need. So that's why it's, it's really important to silo out the content into taxes and, and retirement, into uh, retirement planning, into annuities, whatever it's going to be, so that you know where those consumers are, what, where they're coming in from, right? what silos of content they're coming in from, so you can better append them to, okay, I know this is Jerry. Jerry's clicking on annuities. He's clicked on annuities three times. Let me have a conversation about annuities with Jerry. This is Sam. He's clicked on retirement planning. Let me have a conversation with, with Sam about retirement planning and what that means for them. So that's, that's the as, aspect of the marketing that, that we really want to be able to focus on. Once you have all that set up, now you're delivering personalized communications to those consumers based upon their behavior, their shopping, and then now you're, you're able to kind of create your own, what we call a live idea, if you would, and then aggregate all that data back through. But now you could also look at engaging your prospects with, again, very curious content or very uh, uh, segmented content for what they're looking for based upon what they're pulling from your site and based upon what they're looking at within their Google Trends, and within your, your Google Tag Manager, right? Again, you have a site, utilize it so that now it becomes a lead funnel or conversion opportunity for you and your practice daily. A lot of you might not be familiar with what we call, with, with a study that Google did, and it's called uh, Think Finance, and it's called the Zero Moment of Truth. And the Zero Moment of Truth for Google is that moment of truth that you get to go in as a consumer, and then that's when they're, they're starting to run the meter. That's when they get you to search. And that's when Google starts making basically their money. And one of the things that they found out from this study, um, and Think Finance also, side note, if you, can, if you can sign up for Think Finance, I would do that. It's filled with so much information. Daily, they'll send it to your email box, and it's very, very, very insightful. But one of the things that this study found out was consumers are on the path to purchase for an extended period of time, for a much longer period of time. So what we're talking about today is that if I'm in market today as a consumer, I need, the, I need the advisor to be married to me today. I need the advisor to be marketing to me today, to have that relevant message to me today. As a consumer, I have the right not to be in market for whatever time I want. But then I, as I become back in the market, I show a behavior back in market, you need to be, as an advisor, you need to be walking with that consumer while they're on that path to purchase and engage with that consumer in a very content-driven uh, engagement that allows them to not only get the content they need, but also get it how they want, um, when they want, um, while they're on the path to purchase. So you need to be walking with these consumers for a very uh, long time. You need to be prepared for that. The other thing that, that was interesting to me within the study is the number of sources of content that these consumers are, are, are aggregating, right? 
which again showcases why Raymond James and, and Edward Jones and MetLife and Merrill Lynch and all the others pay so much money in marketing to make sure that their content is the content that this consumer sees. Content, you've heard this said, content's king. It is. Um, but if nobody knows that you're the king and they can't get your content, then what good is it? So we need to make sure that your content is showcased to these consumers while they're in market and while they're on that path to purchase. Right? Comparison shopping and gathering content is extremely helpful in making an informed decision. Most shoppers stated that their, their, their journey took more than a year in some cases, right? So you, you have to be patient. Marketing is not a silver bullet, quick fix. Um, it, it's not that. It's, it's a steady, rhythmic approach and process, right? It's an engagement uh, process that has to have a very relevant and engaged methodology and structure so that you can then bring people to a certain point within their consumer their customer journey and convert them into leads and appointments and eventually nurture them into customers that's the whole aspect of what we want to be able to do the other thing from this zero moment of truth study is shoppers clearly identified experiences with financial representative as the most influential that really struck me, and a lot of what we see within the marketing that we do for financial advisors is sometimes a lot of financial advisors just don't answer the email. They didn't see the email. They didn't see the, the lead conversion. They didn't see the appointment. And then a week later, they're, they're trying to structure, they're trying to hurry up and get that appointment. This is a digital world. And, and, and quite frankly, what we're talking about here today is digital retailing. If you're not Johnny on the spot and you don't have a process to answer back to these consumers that maybe send you an email and say, hey, uh, will I take a penalty if I, if I go for an early withdrawal? You know, what will it cost me? Or if a consumer is sending you those types of emails or booking those appointments and you're responding with, I'm on vacation or I can't meet with you or can we do it next week? You need to be tiptoe ready. You need to always be in the starting block waiting for that gun to, to shoot off because you never know through all these digital segments when a consumer is going to engage you and your brand. So be ready because those experiences or those micro moments are very, very impactful to a consumer to get them to convert and become a customer. Make sure that you have a compelling offer and value statement. Make sure all of your marketing has a lean form or a landing page that it's constantly linking to, right? Good marketing, especially today, is good sales. Always, always, always ask for the appointment. Always have a sales process to get to the appointment. So marketing and sales work hand in hand. But also understand that sales, right, when you start jumping into that sales process, it might take you eight or nine or 10 or 20 calls or email opportunities to get that consumer to say yes. I'm probably one of the hardest people to get a hold of, right? Um, it doesn't mean I don't want to buy anything. It just means I just have very limited time. And a lot of advisors, I think, are conditioned to say, well, I want the phone numbers. How many of you get robocalls, six, seven, eight, ten robocalls a day? So you have to stay focused that it's not about banging out a bunch of phone calls. It's about nurturing the consumer to an engagement level where they feel comfortable because you have a, a compelling offer or value statement to book that appointment with you. If, if you're looking to just book out a bunch of, bang out a bunch of calls, I don't think that's effective marketing. Um, and then it leads you to just buy more and leads that are being shared between more advisors who are just banging out calls to the same consumer and the consumer is going, I'm done, I'm out, I'm not doing this. So be careful with that, just be careful. Make sure that you, have a value statement that really says, this is why my firm's different, this is why we're better, and this is how we've helped consumers in the past. It's critical, very critical. All right, so once you identify, make sure you have a targeting methodology set up, make sure you have a, an engagement methodology set up, where not it, that it's just one action, hey, I sent this consumer one email, but you have a, a workflow methodology set up for your marketing, where Today I sent them this email. Now I'm going to send them a couple days later this email. A couple days later I'm going to send them this direct mail piece, and so on and so on. So we call that a workflow. 
make sure that you have engagement workflows structured for all of the incoming data that you're getting. And a lot of this can be accomplished through CRMs that have built-in workflows already. Um, and it allows you, uh, it's, it's a very good way of nurturing some of the data through the funnel or through the workflows based upon conditions that you might have set up within your CRM. It's very, very important that you have that engaged and that you have that structured um, in, in, in that manner. And again, your content. Make sure that you have your content segmented, right? Where, you know, here we have it set up as week one, week two, week three, but this could be month one, month two, month three, and within the month you have week one, week two, week three. So there's no direct formula on success. It's really, again, what are you trying to get achieved? What are you trying to do? And then what are the consumers that you're trying to engage? What are they doing? What are they looking at? And then the other thing is, what is the content that you're going to lay out to those consumers? So my week one engagements, my week one email can be join my podcast, listen to my webinar, look at this retirement white paper, but always book an appointment. Have a function where they can book an appointment now and they can engage with you now if need be, right? And then put in your personal cell, cell number or some sort of, you know, burn cell that you don't, you know, is only used for work and maybe this marketing approach that you can utilize as well. But step out your content, step out your rhythm that you're going to flow and, and make sure that you have a constant content strategy at least built out for your firm to make sure it becomes more than just a newsletter that you're getting from your FMO or IMO or, or BD. Also, I can't stress enough your value proposition. Make sure you have your value proposition firmed up and ready to go and that everybody at your firm level knows exactly what that is, right? So a lot of advisors are doing Facebook marketing. I know that um, and, uh, and that's great. Careful, this is expensive. I'm going to be flat honest with you guys. It's very, very expensive. When the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke, um, Facebook removed a ton of data. And uh, a lot of us were scrambling to try to figure out how do we replace that data, how do we do that. We, we have it replaced, but um, you're not exclusive, right? See, Facebook, Facebook marketing is not exclusive. If you want to see what your targeted consumer is going to get, I suggest you change your age within Facebook so that you can see what kind of rhythm and ads and what your competitors are doing. Um, you know, a, a very good friend of mine and owner of Steps, Steps to Success Marketing, Brian Stephan, he told me a long time ago, he's look, a good advisor is first a good marketer. So take these steps to make sure that you change yourself in Facebook, if you're on Facebook, to the demographics that you're looking to, uh, to convert so that you can see what they're getting. But realize that when you're marketing to your group, to your localized audience, you probably have six, seven, eight, ten advisors doing the same thing. So that consumer is becoming bombarded, very bombarded with all of these ads and all of these engagement tools. And then what do consumers do? As consumers, we shy away. We stop and we, we go no more. So careful who you choose as a marketing partner that their only job isn't to sell Facebook advertising because, remember, they're making money from the ad spend. They're making a tremendous amount of money from the ad spend. And if their goal is to put one advisor on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, in a certain area, for them, not only does it help their ad spend and increase their ad spend, it allows them to get a better performance on certain ads than others, and yours could be left out of the mix, quite frankly. Um, so the more impressions they serve, the more they make. Your marketing data uh, and partnership should be loyal to you and, and, and not mix data from other advisors. I'm not a big, even in our seminar marketing that we do for advisors, we don't try to put, you know, 10 advisors in Reno uh, for next Saturday. We, we space it out. We, we make sure that there's a very clear indication or line to be demarcation line that we build buffers around the data that we're employing, even with our, with our silhouette data. So, you know, Facebook makes money on serving ads and the marketing companies make money on serving ads within Facebook. So you're not special to them. Uh, so think about how you're going to capture the data, how it's going to convert at your site, if you're going to point it to your site, and make sure that you have a sales process, a daily sales process, built into your practice and built into your rhythm. Please, I implore you to do so. 
and that all the campaigns, uh, um, all the information that you're getting from your site, from your ads, from your digital, from your direct mail, your landing pages, all of that should convert well into a CRM. And again, you know, a lot of the top CRMs are a little bit expensive, but and they put a lot of work on you to get all of these silos built, but it's easy enough to do if you take the time to do it where you can structure all of this incoming data. And then all the incoming data you structure can then be siloed to the content that you have ready, set, and go, that the content that you've built out. Um, so all of that can happen pretty quickly and pretty easily and more important, efficiently. So that if you're running current appointments or you're engaged in current client activity, your marketing funnels are still working on the back end, ensuring that you're creating a consistent lead flow for your practice, ensuring that you're creating a consistent engagement flow for your practice. So if any of you have any questions about CRMs that you've been looking at, um, you know, feel free to contact me. I'll, I'll give you my honest opinion about some of them. Some of them are good, some of them are really complicated, and some of them are okay. Um, but they all have relevant price points. But the most important thing is that the data that you're getting from the CRM, is, it's just a historical snapshot of, of what's going on. Um, it's not an indication of, of what, you know, it's a historical snapshot of, of what John Smith did 30 days ago. So make sure your marketing should be the updating information or the updating incoming data streams for what John Smith is doing today. That's what your marketing should be doing for you and your content section should be doing for you. All right, so with that, again, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the time that everybody's given to me today. I think we're, we're running a little bit ahead, um, which is good because it allows us to have some Q&A and then I didn't hold you hostage for a whole hour or so. But again, I, I, I really thank you and the opportunity to, to kind of be with you guys today uh, and the time that you've given me. So I think we're gonna do a, a Q&A Yes, thank you so much, Junior. Really appreciate it. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, if anyone does have any questions, we do have a couple of ways that we can ask them. You can use the chat feature that I know some of you have used today, but we also have a Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So feel free to ask either of your questions in there. But um, again, Junior, wonderful stuff. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I know we had one question earlier. But yes, just to reiterate from that earlier, this, uh, this session was recorded and we will make it available at a later time as well. Uh, we do have experience uh, working with H I New York Life is, is um, uh, a good organization and, and we do have experience with them and we have ways that, you know, we can integrate our content with Smarsh so that they have um, uh, compliance, you know, compliance is the biggest uh, hurdle that we have to go through with New York Life. But yeah, we, we have all those uh, ways that we can integrate with all that information. Okay, uh, I wish my views could go. Thank you. Hey, thank you, uh, Darren. Thank you. I appreciate it. Looks like we have another one from uh, Charles here. Do you work with Prudential Advisors? Yeah, same, same. We can do the same um, um, with Prudential. It's the same thing. So what what those firms want to be able to do is uh, the same thing. They would just want to make sure that they have an accounting of what you send out um, to those consumers or prospects. But yeah, we can easily integrate all of that into their smart systems or whatever email compliance systems that they have. And we can integrate all of that data. And then if you think about Prudential or New York Life, you know, it's the hub and spoke or the mothership to the individual advisor. They give you a great amount of data based upon what they see nationally. But if, again, you're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, what do you care what's going on in Atlanta, Georgia? You don't, right? So you need to be able to localize that data, that experience, that engagement, and, and the action and process for you at a moment's notice. And, and that's what we essentially want to build, or we are, we're built. Okay. 
Okay. See another one here as well. Um, so do you suggest that we, that uh, agents advisors have their own website or use a microsite provided by the company? And uh, do you create websites yourself? Uh, so I, yes, I believe that agents and advisors are their own brand and um, that they should have their own sites. I, I truly believe that. We do create sites. Uh, we do create uh, sites in the content. And quite frankly, um, I reviewed some the other day from a, another national firm that an advisor was asking me about. I think it's crazy expensive in some cases. It doesn't need to be that expensive. It really doesn't. So, but yeah, I firmly believe that uh, advisors should have their own site and their own brand. Yeah, appreciate your question there. Okay. I, I got a question for the remaining participants. Are, are a lot of you doing Facebook marketing? Are you engaging in Facebook marketing in any way? And then how's the quality of that marketing been for you if you are doing that? Or that LinkedIn marketing, a lot of you are doing that as well? Just curious, actually. Nobody's going to answer my question. Well, here we go. Okay. Both Facebook and LinkedIn. Good to hit both, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when you do that, um, are you in control, Charles, of how you can uh, appropriate some of the data for there, for, for that? And if, if you are, the reason why I'm saying it is because fa both Facebook, Facebook and LinkedIn have what's called um, custom audience profiles. So I would encourage you that, um, oh, if you pay for Facebook ads, then track. Yeah, so here's what I would encourage you to do. If you're gonna post any of those ads, you take your client emails and you put that into Facebook and you put that into LinkedIn. You create what's called a lookalike audience. So it's the theory of birds of a feather flock together, right? So a lot of us um, hang out and do things with people that pretty much are similar to us, right? If we drink wine, we hang out with wine drinkers. If we drink beer, we hang out with beer drinkers. Uh, if we'd like to sail, we hang out with people who like to sail. So Facebooks and LinkedIn's, they have the same patterns of behaviors, which is what we call a lookalike audience. And that lookalike audience will mirror your custom audience. Take the next time you post something or you're going to boost or put an ad spend to Facebook, make sure that you inject your client emails and then build a lookalike audience around that. So that, that way you can then expand your reach for consumers that you kind of already have as clients. And I think that'll be very useful for you. Great insights as well. You know, I think that answers uh, Wilfredo's as well, who said he was, you know, looking to do a little bit more on Facebook there. So, so great insights there, Junior. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I think we are, I think we are, uh, you know, coming up on time here. But I, I do want to thank everybody for joining us today. And again, Junior, want to thank you for your expertise and your time. And uh, we we greatly appreciate it here. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. All right. Hope everyone has a great rest of their week and a great day. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, everybody.